Right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the latest non-farm payrolls webinar with me, Michael Hewson, and my colleague Colin Szynski on Friday the 6th of November. And the most important non-farm payrolls number after the last important non-farm payrolls number. Before I get started, I have to go through a little bit of housekeeping and what have you, um, display a risk warning for your, uh, uh, for your benefit, just to make sure that um, any, any information that Colin and I talk about is not intended to provide trading advice. Um, so what we can't do is tell you where to buy or where to sell. Um, hopefully this will just give you an indication of the overall direction of the markets and um, where we think or how, or how we think the information will be interpreted by traders and investors alike. So once we've got the risk warnings out of the way, um, I will then get started with my colleague Colin, who has just this minute joined me. Hello, Colin. Hello, Michael. Good morning, everyone. It okay. looks like another exciting day for the uh, markets with a big, uh, big non-farm payrolls report. It certainly is. So let's first and foremost um, put one thing to bed. While this is an important payrolls report, it's not the most important payrolls report because that one comes next month and it's sandwiched between the last ECB rate meeting of the year and the Fed decision, which comes around about 10 days later. Um, so what we've heard this week thus far has been a little bit confusing because let me cast your mind back to Mark Carney's press conference yesterday at the Bank of England where the Bank of England expressed concerns about the Chinese economy and any spillover effects the slowdown there was having. That doesn't chime with what Janet Yellen said 24 hours before that where um, she still said she still expected to see a rate hike but more importantly, the last Fed statement said that they weren't, or implied, that they weren't concerned about China anymore. So you've got the Fed on the one hand saying they're less concerned about China, and then you've got the Bank of England on the other hand saying they're more concerned about China. So basically what that does is it makes the Federal Reserve the standout central bank when it comes to um, looking to raise rates. They stand alone. The Bank of England was one of the was was the last central bank um, that um, you know has has pulled back from the precipice, if you like, of potentially raising rates, and um, that certainly does make things a little bit interesting when it comes to whether or not the Fed is going to raise rates next month. So let's start and first and foremost and look at expectations with respect to the payrolls numbers, because certainly in the context of what is a good number and what's a bad number. We're expecting 180,000, which to my mind could be wrong. It's a little bit on the optimistic side. Don't know what you think, Colin. But it, it we... seems to me as though what what people are looking at here is is for a nice rebound. So I'm seeing one. It, it, I've seen several consensus estimates, all of which are between 180 and 185 this morning, and um, I think the, the people are uh, generally speaking are looking for some pretty big rebounds. And we've had some signs of that. We saw a pop in Chicago PMI. We saw a pop in in U.S. non-manufacturing PMI. But those are. But we're we're now looking. This is the first really hard number that. We're going to see, and even the uh, the ADP number was was pretty much bang on around was around 180. So the, we're looking at a similar number for that. And, and what I think is going to be important here, both for the U.S. and Canada, and I'll, I'll talk about Canada too, because they're under the there's a, one thing that's affecting both of them. The street's expecting a a 10,000 increase for Canada this month, and uh, and I think we'll get a little bit of a an improvement on the the big plunge in in full time that we saw last month. But the one that that's really to watch for with the numbers and and the big variable is going to be government hiring this month because you probably had a slowdown in government hiring in both countries in October in the United States you had the negotiations over the uh, the, the budget over the uh, over the debt ceiling questions of well is the US are we going to hire somebody and then not be able to pay them or hire somebody and then the government's going to get shut down so it wouldn't surprise me at all if you saw a, a slowdown in government hiring in the US and in Canada there was a federal election campaign underway and it's pretty much standard that governments don't hire uh, certainly not for 
certainly not for upper level positions during a uh, during an election campaign. That's pretty much to be expected. So that's why I'm I'm actually looking a little bit below consensus on both. I'm looking for 170 for the U.S. and uh, and and flat for uh, for Canada uh, based on the fact that the. Uh, that the government hiring is slowed. Now, the other interesting thing, and it has me thinking that we could have a big miss in the U.S., was that uh, St. Louis Fed President Bullard has been out talking this morning, and he's one of the more hawkish members of the Fed. And after the last disappointment, he was one of the first ones out, him and uh, Boston Fed's Rosengren were out saying, well, we think employment uh, growth is going to slow as we near full employment, trying to... Uh, trying to say they remain, uh, give a case for remaining hawkish even with soft employment numbers. Well, he was out this morning saying that uh, he doesn't think 200 is sustainable long term and that he thinks that uh, 100 to 125 uh, employment growth going forward would be would be more reasonable and, uh, and indicate a, a growing economy, which suggests to me that uh, he's trying to get out ahead of something. Yeah, I mean, I, I would concur with that point. And certainly if you look at the the direction of travel this year compared to last year. Um, October, November and December last year for the US economy were the three, well, it was, it was the best quarter um, Q4 of 2014 in quite some time. We look at those 423 in November, 221 in October, 329 in December. And yet when we look at the summer months, they weren't particularly weak either whereas we were at the beginning of 2014 when we had the polar vortex and that really, really cold winter. But now what we're getting is a significant decline. There's a significant direction of travel from May to September. The numbers are trending lower. Now, that can continue, or we can get, as Colin said, a little bit of a rebound. I think what's going to be important is not so much the headline number, and we could come in around about 155, 160, is whether or not we get any revisions to these two numbers here in September and August, because um, certainly we've, we've seen a really sharp drop from July into August and September, and Colin has indicated he thinks that's maybe because people were worried about a September rate hike. Certainly does sort of make sense. That would then seem to suggest that potentially we could get a little bit of a pickup in October on the back of the fact that they didn't um, they didn't raise they, they didn't raise in September. We'll see. But certainly as we head into the back end of 2015, um, we look at the number of jobs that have thus far been added in 2015. It's currently around about 1.8 million jobs um, as we and here we are sitting in November. We've still got another three months of data, but uh, in 2014 the U.S. economy added 3.2 million jobs. So we're well shy of that this year thus far, uh, and that sort of does you know feed into the wider narrative that even though unemployment is coming down, the unemployment rate at 5.1%. It still feeds into a slightly weaker narrative when it comes to the overall underlying data. More importantly, consumer sentiment, retail sales thus far, 2.3%. It's, it's, it's okay, but when you've had a 50% drop in oil prices and gasoline prices, you'd expect that to be higher. As for durable goods, we're down 2.2% thus far on the year. Durable goods are big ticket items like... Um, Television, flat screen TVs, white goods, um, that sort of thing. So U.S. consumers don't feel confident enough to go out and buy big ticket items, even though auto sales are at their highest levels for years. But you then have to factor in the, the prospect that an awful lot of auto sales generally tend to be done on higher purchase or lease agreement. Therefore, if people can't give up the payments, they give the car back, and basically the loan gets the loan gets wound down. So auto sales is sometimes not the best indicator of um, a robust U.S. consumer. So let's look at some of the key points to keep an eye out for. First and foremost, yeah. I think... Can I um, a quick thing, Michael, before sure. we go on? Firing. Just one last thing to note on the uh, on the employment figures. The other one that I've just been keeping an eye on is the um, jobless claims. And uh, jobless claims have remained low. Continuing claims have remained low uh, as well. So even though as we do watch for a, a slowdown in uh, in job growth, we haven't seen the uptick on, and we haven't seen unemployment increase either. So we'll be, well, certainly another thing that we'll keep an eye on. Sorry to interrupt you, Michael. Please. No, continue. no, that's fine. I mean, you, the unemployment rate is, is is important to a point, 
but it also needs to be um, observed through the prism of the labour participation rate, which Absolutely. is at a near 40-year uh, low. Uh, and what that means is that the percentage of the US population of working age who are actually um, available to work and if the participation rate drops, it usually brings the unemployment rate down with it. I think in recent times, Janet Yellen has been pointing to the U6 um, unemployment rate, which is this number here, which I'm going to show you on my Bloomberg. And um, that basically, that's this number here, which we're looking at right now, which is around 10%. And that's the underemployment if you like, and that has slipped back up, but that's near 10%. So we'll be, looking for, we'll be looking at that. More importantly, we'll be looking at whether or not there's any inflationary pressures, wage growth. That has continued to remain fairly weak. So we'll be looking for an above expectation rise in that. If this number here is weak, then that's going to be dollar negative, I think, irrespective of what the payrolls number is. Um, maybe you would disagree with that, Colin, but I think if you're looking at average earnings, you really want to see evidence of inflation, given the Fed's dual mandate, the fact that they t have to target inflation as well as unemployment and uh, jobs growth. Um, yes, I think it's particularly important because the uh, uh, wages are more sticky. They don't fall as fast as uh, as other measures. So uh, it's important to, uh, if you did see, for example, wages starting to come down, would definitely be an indication of uh, of lowering in inflation pressures. Whereas if they stay up, well, wages tend to stay. It, they do tend to stay harder. People don't usually want to give back their uh, their uh, wage gains. So Very let's have a quick so let's have a quick look at some of the key levels. So S and P five hundred, big resistance just above twenty one twelve. We can see that with this horizontal line here. Um about strong resistance at the two hundred day moving average. It's a similar sort of story on the S on the US thirty. Big resistance at eighteen thousand. We can see that borne out in this chart here. I'm going to try and make this as quickly quick as I can. So here right at the 18,000 just below that big resistance but the big support around about 17,060. Now it's going to be difficult to get a clear idea of what's going to happen with respect to the stock market in the event of a disappointing number simply because of this so-called Goldilocks scenario. If it's a good number, um, investors will take it as a view that the U.S. economy is doing well and is able to withstand a rate hike and they'll buy stocks. If it's a bad number, then again, it's likely to be treated positively because of the fact that it's likely to keep the Fed on hold for longer. So, you know, it's heads I win, tells you lose. It's, you know, it's that sort of scenario. For me, the big level, as far as the dollar is concerned, is dollar yen at 122. 122 resistance, if we can get a foothold above 122, then we could go for a run towards 123 very, very quickly. So you want to see a positive number. And a positive number, I think, in terms of the dollar, is going to be an above expectation average earnings number or a, um, a significant um, decline in the unemployment rate and a very positive payrolls number. So anything above 170 or 180, that will be dollar positive. Let's look at euro dollar and the key points, that, key points there. Sorry, I just clicked the wrong button because it's ticking down and we've got 90 seconds to go. We've broken below a very key support level on euro dollar and we're also approaching a very, very key long-term support level around about 108.20. If we break through this 108 level, then we're probably going to go for a run towards 106 and 105. That's a very, very key support level from the lows at 82.30, which unfortunately I can't show you on here at the moment. Cable again, very, very quickly. Um, 150.80, very key support level. It's the May lows. It's the September lows. We've broken below the long-term trend line support. So dollar positive number. Watch the downside targets there. Let's do the dollar CAD because that's also showing some significant areas of support and resistance, particularly on the chart that I'm about to show you here. We can see that this is a, one, this is a daily chart. So we're pushing against resistance right now on dollar CAD around about 132.20. If we can break below, above 132.20, then we're probably going to go for a run towards 133. A poor dollar number, US dollar number, could see us slip back to this long-term support level from the lows that we saw in May. Lastly, before we get into that, gold. Dollar positive number should see gold come down and test below the 1,100 level, where we're currently a little bit oversold. Poor number will basically give us a little bit of a ratchet higher in gold prices. So let's just do the quick dollar yen 
and look at the initial reaction of the dollar, and here we go. 270. Wow, that was wow, a big wow. jump. That's a big jump, and average, average earnings. Look at that. Wow. Okay, well, I think we've pretty much said it all. 271, and and, and, and the Canadian numbers as, as well are very, very positive. Big rebound in... Uh, that should be a big read on the full time. Yeah, full time went from negative 62 last month to plus nine. Part time, 35,000 trimmed back from 74 last month. So nice increase in Canada jobs, huge increase in U.S. jobs. We were we were thinking we get, might get a bit of a pop, but I didn't think we'd get that kind of a pop. Wow, no, that I mean, was a big well, bounce back. Let's just do it. Let's just raise rates now, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> September revision only down 5k too, so that's not having much of an impact on the headline number either. I mean, that's going to knock gold on its backside. I just yeah, can't. I just, yeah, it's it's gone way down. So really, we're 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 looking to retest. Gold has busted 1100 and on to 1090. 10, wow. Yeah, yeah, 1080. I think we're looking at 1080 on gold. Um, most definitely. I mean, we really need to get back above 1100 now, on uh, on gold on gold prices. Most definitely. That's um that's unambiguously positive. Yeah, we got dollar yen has popped for a send up to 123. Big breakout for dollar yen. Yeah, we're looking right. to. It did. It blew through 122 and went straight to 123. Mm. I don't think anyone would have been able to get on in on the back of that, unfortunately. No, that um, was just like a rocket. I mean, that's just. So we're now looking really on dollar yen at that trend line resistance from the highs in June as our next as our next resistance target on dollar yen coming in just above 124. And the wage data is also important. That's risen 0.4 percent. You know, and I think that's really the kicker. We have seen a slight downward revision to the um, previous month's numbers to 137. But overall, if we look at the if we look at the two-month adjustment for non-farms, it's actually positive to the tune of 12,000. So we may have seen a downward revision in um, um, we may have seen a downward revision to the September numbers, but it looks like August has been revised up judging by that change in the two month net revision of plus twelve. Yeah, so, that's so seventeen for August. Yeah. So so yeah, I mean basically that that's unambiguously positive. It looks now um as if we're probably gonna get a rate hike in December, um with respect to the US Fed. Um I still can't help thinking that would potentially be a mistake. But when we look at what the bond markets are pricing in it's pretty much unambiguously um, a pretty pretty decent sell-off now in the U.S. Treasury market. We look at the U.S. two-note, two-year note, sharp move lower there in the daily charts. So I mean, basically, we're trading at four-year highs now on U.S. Treasury yields, Treasury prices, four-year lows, yields move inversely to prices. So when prices move down, yields move up. And it's it's really sort of the same sort of thing with respect to with respect to five year as well. So we've got we've seen a significant decline, ladies and gentlemen, in five year prices, ten year prices as well, as pushing US yields higher. And um uh, it essentially means that we're probably gonna see further dollar upside. And now let's have another look at Euro dollar. Well below one oh eight twenty now. So now what we're really looking for now is a, re is a test of 106.5. We've already touched 107 on that initial move lower already. But with the ECB, European Central, the, I think the only thing that really can stop the Fed now from hiking in December is if euro dollar continues to fall very, very sharply. Yes, yeah, so we're seeing such a big uh, appreciation in uh, in U.S. dollar. It could, uh, it, it, we'll see if it spooks the Fed from uh, from its dragging on the economy. Although I still think I think that the uh, the way the U.S. dollar has moved up, the rate hike has probably already been priced into the the market at least uh, at least one. But wow, has it ever uh, has it ever uh, moved up today? This is a really really strong move for the U.S. dollar. The other interesting thing is I'm looking here at the uh, at the payrolls is it's almost all private payrolls. The, the non-firms two. 
271. The private payroll is 268. So this isn't even being we we can't even say this is government driven. This is definitely private sector driven. And if you look at the private payrolls, Which the upper one, provision yeah. was from 118 to 149. So uh, that's actually quite encouraging as well because you could say, well, you know, if it was the government hiring, you'd say, well, it's the government hiring. But if this is the when the private sector is doing it, people take as a higher uh, they take more seriously. Yeah. So it's quite interesting. How much of this do you think was a little bit of a relief rally as a result of the fact that the Fed didn't raise in September? Definitely a possibility. Which means Definitely. that we which means that we could potentially get a bit of a slowdown in the November numbers when we sit here a month from now? It's it's an interesting sorry it's an interesting question. When I went back and I looked at the 2004, the, when when the Fed started raising rates last, they were the month before they raised rates, non-farm payables were 350,000. The month after they raised rates, they were 50,000, and they stayed at, they stayed below 100 for two or three months, and then they started creeping back upward again. So it's a it's a funny one now because you know I I asked the question, did I, uh, certainly that the relief rally is uh, is is a possibility once you got past the uh, the September and they didn't raise rates that people could have moved on that. The, my question is, would they have done it anyways? Like was that too two-month drop we had in August and September pricing in the, the rate liftoff, or now do we have another round of it if the, with people speculating on December, which then becomes another question. If the Fed doesn't go in December, do we keep having this every single time? Mm. People think the Fed's ready to start raising rates, at which point you say, well, maybe they should just get it over with so everybody can move on. <laughs> There's yeah. so many different ways you can you can uh, you can look at it as uh, at this prism from so many different directions, which is uh, is interesting, and that's why I think it's it, it's uh, created to a certain extent some some confusion. I mean, we had not that long ago the uh, so many different Fed members were saying so many different things. They had to kind of back off and say, okay, mm. no, really, we're not that different as what you as what it sounds like. No, absolutely, and we're looking at the stock market now, the S and P, and they don't like it. They think it's too strong. The market thinks it's way too strong, which suggests that potentially, you know, they, they, they think that maybe the, the Fed may not do one and done. Because I think, although this is my interpretation of it, everyone's been talking, well, the Fed may do one and done and have done with it. But if you see average earnings jump from 2.2% to 2.5% year on year, 0.4 month on month, then from being really, really pessimistic about the U.S. economy, and suddenly you get a jobs number like this, the knee-jerk reaction is to go too far the other way. And as a result... too optimistic. And too optimistic. And, that, and the stock market's thinking, oh, oh, okay, um, we're, we're not so much in a gold or luck scenario because we posted such a good jobs number. Or, you know, the euros goes into freefall. I mean, look at the pound. The pound's absolutely collapsing. It's just broken through 150.80, and it's lost, it's lost four big figures in the last 48 hours. I mean, just look at that. That's I mean, a huge decline. So the pound is in free wow. fall. If the Bank of England is not careful, they're going to have a run on the pound. Um, you know, what, what's, what's going to happen? You know, we've broken a long-term trend line from the lows here. Where's the next support level? It's a 149.95 figure, which is 149.80, which is these series of lows and highs through here. So, you know, why did Bullard come out and raise expectations or lower expectations about a potentially disappointing payrolls report? And then suddenly we get a very good number. In fact, a number that's blown the doors off. It's totally bizarre, isn't it? Because it seemed to me as though he was trying to talk people down. Yeah. And, and he, he didn't must want have, to get caught up. He must have figured that there was going to be a low number. Yeah, he, well, he must have known it was a high number, surely. They get the numbers beforehand. Certainly, yeah. one, one thing's for sure, equity markets don't like it. Um, and, you know, this, is, this has been one of my major... I think this is what have been my, one of the things that's had me scratching my head for quite some time now, certainly with the performance of equity markets in U.S. and European equity markets is the divergence between the two. Uh, I did a video earlier this week talking about it, talking about the fact that, um, you know, we're at a very, very key resistance level on the top side with respect to the DAX. Um, resistance at, um, 
just above 11,000, 200 day moving average, and um, the 61.8 resistance level. And it's pretty much the same in the, on the FTSE 100 as well. You know, it makes me a little bit, you know, concerned that we're, we're starting to run out of steam. And actually on the FTSE, we could be looking to roll over a little bit. We've traded sideways since the beginning of October. And, um, you know, w w we could actually well start to drift lower. Um, certainly this number does sort of fly in the face of some of the ISM reports, certainly on the manufacturing side that we've seen in recent weeks. So again, we, I don't think we can read too much into one number, but certainly the knee-jerk reaction for this is, um, the knee-jerk reaction to this is an unambiguously good number, and that it looks very much like we're going to get a, a little bit of a rate rise in December. The big question is, will then the Fed be forced to reverse it in 2016? Yeah, that's a hard one to say. I know, and I guess the other part of which will be that the, my feeling has always been that they would do one and then they would bend over backwards to say they're going to wait a while. But mm. uh, but as you noted, if the stock market is starting to come back off, people may be revisiting this and starting to think, well, are they going to go? I still don't think they'll go every meeting, but they could still go once a quarter or once a half mm. until and at least until they get up to. So the possibility is, say, you, you went now and then a year from now, uh, December 2016, you might be around 1%, I think is probably not if you continue to put up those kind of uh, those kind of payroll numbers and I think that's the big thing where everyone's looking to price in one and done a number as strong as this is going to make people think well actually it won't be one and done unless right. unless the November report is as an absolute shocker so this one's really strong and then this month November when we sit here in December is an absolute nightmare. Then what does the Fed do? Then they've got a problem. Yeah. And then they do, and I still think they've got a problem because there's so much conflicting data out there. Yeah, I don't think that you've got clearly, I don't think you've got a clear idea of what the, the, the US economy is doing. Having said that, if we look at the Fed funds, um, if we look at the Fed funds worth, it's now at 72. Um, let me just see if I can bring it up, see if it's up to date. No, I'm still showing 56, but uh, it looks like the potential, the market is now starting to price in, no, it's 74 now. There we go. Let there me just go. bring that across. And there it is in the here, 16th, 74% probability of a rate rise in December, which is almost as positive as we were, as we were negative a at the, uh, well, less than, less than that, I think, in, I think about three weeks ago, before the last Fed meeting, it was 26%. <laughs> yes, and oh. I think after the payroll, I think after the last payrolls numbers, it was it was even below that. It was more like 10%. Yeah, it was pretty low at at, uh, at the payrolls. So that's so, a huge turnaround in a month. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a huge turnaround in three weeks. Three weeks, yeah. Which is basically what we're talking about. So um, now I'm actually trying to get rid of this and I actually can't get rid of it I can't get rid of it off my monitor which is not great oh boy uh, I'm trying to let's see where are we give me a second ladies and gents what can you see at the moment still seeing the Bloomberg uh, okay got rid of it there we go. No, going away. We're back. Right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, before I wrap this up, um, is there anything um, that we haven't covered that you'd like me to cover? Go back over. Dollar Cad, you want to have another look at that? Sure. Because we it's want to see. It's not getting hit quite as hard as some of the other currencies, probably because the Canadian employment was uh, was so good. I mean, yes, it's, I see it's, it's broken out of this triangle here, mm. but I think it's down about. The U.S. is up about 0.6 against Canada and over 1% against a lot of other currencies. Um, so, but that, that still, that is a breakout from a symmetrical triangle, which signals a uh, uh, likely move upward. And we're retesting the previous lows on the Aussie around about 70.65. So, um, yeah, we're, um, we're at a key support level there. I've asked to go back and talk about gold 
quite happy to do that. But I certainly think that um, now that we've broken below this succession of lows here, then really, what I think I think the likelihood is, look at this. We've got one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight successive daily declines in gold. That's pretty. That's a pretty distinct trend there, but it also makes me wonder as to whether or not potentially we could be near a short-term base. Certainly the July lows at 10.70 I think are going to be a very, very tough nut to crack. Um, but we are also approaching a number of very, very key support levels in gold. Let's blow this all the way out. 2010 lows at 10.44 are a big, big level. We can see that through this chart there. And also Below that, we've also got a, a very significant uh, resistance level around about 9.46. But I, th I think you know the next support level on gold prices is going to be this congestion period between 10.70 and 10.80. I would expect to see some form of a rebound from these sorts of levels. I can't remember the last time gold went on a nine or a 10-day decline. Um, Certainly, certainly not in the last few years have we seen that sort of decline without some sort of um, stabilization process and a little bit of a rebound. But um, for, the, for the time being, the momentum is clearly for a lower, lower gold price. Should find support around about these sorts of this sort of area around here. But I certainly would be looking for a little bit of a rebound back to 11.10 over the course of the next couple of weeks. Especially, I think if um, uh, subsequent U.S. data comes in on the disappointing side. Anything else, ladies and gents, that you want to talk about, cover? Let's have a quick look at the bond markets to see whether or not we've had some some breakout um, breakouts in that particular area. So we looked at the five-year, and we've broken sharply below all the support levels there. The yields go up. Oh, it's the wrong one. Sorry about that. And the 10-year. Well, it's not back at the... It's an interesting one there. It's not back at the, uh, the lows that we saw in uh, June. So it suggests that the, the longer end of the curve is not reacting anywhere near as aggressively as the shorter end. So it remains to be seen. But uh, certainly I think um, the momentum has shifted even more now, and the Yellen Draghi spread, as people like to call it, is likely to widen out even further over the course of the next few weeks ahead of the ECB meeting, um, particularly um, if the ECB does embark on further easing measures, the Fed will be faced with a very difficult problem. How do they stop the euro pushing even lower? It certainly blows my um, expectations for a rebound in the euro out of the water. Uh, Colin, are you there? Yes, I'm still here, Michael. I have okay. a question. Uh, based on this, and, and if we did see the uh, the your ECB go to more easing and the Fed going towards more uh, uh, tightening into the into the new year, uh, is there a possibility that we could see this getting back closer to par over yeah, the longer easily. term? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there is. I mean, to be quite honest, the euro has been down at parity before. It was a long time ago. It's been down to 82.50 before in 2001, but that, that in itself presents problems for the U.S. Yes, it does because the um, certainly I think the uh, you know I mean their export side has already been crushed and uh, and we're seeing it in corporate earnings mm. and uh, and if if we do see the U.S. dollar have another run upwards would uh, would definitely have a, a negative impact on earnings and and maybe that's one of the things we're seeing play out in the stocks today as well. Yeah, and higher I think U.S. dollar, lower corporate earnings. Yeah, they're starting to price in. I think they're starting to price price that in, and that's why stocks are struggling. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Okay, ladies and gents, that's it for this month. Um, we'll be doing one of these again on in December, 
and we will also be doing a preview to the December FOMC meeting on the day in question, which I think is, is it the 15th, Colin? I think so. Let me just double check here. It's the 16th. 16th. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. so the next two webinars that Colin and myself will be doing will be 1.15, first Friday in December, non-farm payrolls, which is the 4th of December. And then we'll be doing a preview of the FOMC meeting at 3 p.m. on the 16th of December. So stick that date in your diaries, ladies and gents. Hopefully the form, the application form is on the website under the education section. Sign up for that and uh, we'll go through this again and see whether or not um, we get um, another surprise and whether it's a positive surprise or a negative surprise. Otherwise, thanks very much for your company today, and we'll talk to you all in a month's time. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, Michael.